Beside him stood Park Suho, the young prodigy whose destiny intertwined with Isix. Park Suho, despite his youth, possessed an innate sense of harmony with the environment around him, a power that both fascinated and unnerved those who crossed paths with him. His journey into the heart of the Lokoko tribe's domain wasn't solely for knowledge or exploration. It was driven by a desire to understand his own abilities and to forge alliances that would shape the future. As they ventured deeper into the forest, the air grew thick with the scent of ancient magic and whispered secrets. Isik, ever vigilant, scanned their surroundings with a practiced eye, his mind calculating every potential threat and opportunity. Suho, quieter but equally perceptive, absorbed the energy of the forest, sensing the ebb and flow of its life force. The young boy, sensing their shared determination and purpose, spoke again, his voice tinged with curiosity and awe. Sir Isaac, why are we here? What are we looking for? His innocent query hung in the air, echoing the unspoken questions that drove them deeper into the heart of the unknown. Isaac <laughs> knelt beside the boy, his gaze steady and reassuring. We are here, young one, to uncover truths that have been hidden for far too long. The Lokoko tribe holds secrets that may yet shape our path forward. Suho, listening intently, felt a surge of anticipation. He knew that their journey would not only test their courage and resolve, but would also reveal truths that could change everything they knew about their world. As they moved onward, shadows danced among the ancient trees, hinting at mysteries waiting to be unraveled and alliances waiting to be forged in the crucible of their quest. The man holding the lantern introduces the place they were at as the young boy's new home, which startles the kid. He looked around, all nervous, saying that the headmaster had mentioned he had been adopted into a good family. But looking at what was in front of him was simply a cave. It turns out that the man was Set Labaskerville, who tells the young boy that there seems to be a misunderstanding. As his appearance started to change, Set tells the young boy that the cave isn't the house he'll be staying in, but the place he will be going to. And Set's appearance had completely changed as the young boy looked at him with fear in his eyes. Confusion everywhere. Set's appearance had transformed into an icy being with a single eye in the center, and sharp fangs all around with tentacles. The young boy could only stare and do nothing as tears filled his eyes. His last word was calling out for his mommy, as Set devoured him completely, leaving behind only blood and the shoes that the young boy wore previously. As he regains his human form, Set could only smile and mention that children sure are the tastiest. Set licks the blood off his face, smiling as though he was turned on by eating kids. After all, he couldn't help himself. It turns out that this was no longer Set Labaskerville, but actually a being who was part of the demon's ten elite corpses, the tenth corpse known as Andromalius. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. Best sword magic? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. Back in the same cave from where the young orphan was last seen with Set, we now see a throne present deep within the cave as a figure sits on it. Set was there, drinking a cup of wine, talking about how it wasn't enough. A crow was present on the table beside him. He was thinking about how the human supply wasn't enough, making him question if he should foster humans like animals, turning them into livestock and creating an organization. This was no longer Set of the Baskerville clan, but instead was Andromalius, the tenth corpse who belonged to the demon Ten Elite Corpses. Looking at the crow with multiple yellow-red eyes on the table beside him, he asks about what it thinks and calls the crow its eighth. It turns out that the small crow with its creepy eyes was actually the eighth demon of the demon Ten Elite Corpses. He tells Andromalius that he was against his idea, as he knew that if things escalate, then the possibility of humans learning about their existence will increase. Andromalius, seated upon his throne amidst the eerie atmosphere of the cave, contemplated the implications of his conversation with the Eighth Demon. The plan to gather magic power through gruesome means weighed heavily on his mind, as did the cautionary words about avoiding notice from the Baskerville Hounds. Sipping his drink, a grim concoction made from the blood of humans, Andromalius reflected on the complexities of his role as one of the Ten Elite Corpses. His allegiance to the demonic cause required him to tread carefully between accumulating power and avoiding detection by the vigilant Baskervilles. The Eighth Demon's departure left behind a trail of black liquid, a stark reminder of their ominous pact and shared goal, the downfall of humans through the opening of gates connecting the realms of demons and mortals. Andromalius knew that their success hinged not only on secrecy, but also on the meticulous execution of their dark rituals. As he rose from his throne, Andromalius couldn't shake a lingering doubt about the stability of their plan. The unexpected emotional bond between Hugo and his granddaughter 
posed a potential complication. Hugo's recent display of emotion and vulnerability threatened to disrupt the cold, calculated demeanor that Andromalius deemed essential for their schemes to proceed smoothly. Andromalius paced the cavernous chamber, his mind racing with strategies to maintain Hugo's detachment and to exploit the vulnerabilities within the Baskerville family. His gaze fixed upon the tiny skulls and skeletons that adorned the cave walls, silent witnesses to the horrors he had inflicted to fuel his ambitions. With a determined breath, Andromalius reaffirmed his commitment to the cause, even as uncertainty clouded his thoughts. The path ahead was fraught with peril and unpredictability, but the fate of their plans rested upon his ability to navigate the treacherous waters between demon kind and humanity. Now Andril knew that all the blame lay with a certain bastard, Vakir von Baskerville, the man, the myth, the legend. Andromalius recalled how that annoying guy survived when the venomous snake was released when he was younger. He even thought about how great it was when Vakir died in the forest. But instead, Vakir had returned with Hugo's granddaughter. Biting his thumb, Andromalius became annoyed at how much work he had done previously to destroy Hugo. Letting his emotions run wild, Andromalius decided from this moment on that it would be good for him to get rid of the problem. We now change scenes to see Hugo and Vakir walking together side by side through a hallway. As they continued to walk, Vakir started to silently think to himself. Taking a peek at Hugo, he recalled that Hugo had summoned him. They had been walking in silence for the past five minutes. This prompted the question, why did Hugo suddenly summon him? Looking at Hugo's current state, Vakir could see that he was full of openings, a chance that wouldn't happen again. Now was the perfect chance to kill Hugo, but Vakir closed his eyes instead, because if it were the Vakir of the past, those would have been his thoughts. But the Vakir right now was different. Hugo then spoke out loud, telling Vakir that honestly, he knew that Vakir hated him, which surprised Vakir. Immediately, Vakir thought that Hugo had sensed his murderous intent, but then Hugo explained that as a father who referred to his sons as bloodhounds and had placed them all into dangerous situations, he felt that his sons had always despised him. He also mentioned that he had been cruel to Vikir since he was young, even though Vikir did everything well. So he started to think that his hatred towards him was something he needed to bear as a father. Hugo continued to explain that all of this was due to his vengeance towards the barbarians. It was his carelessness to only know how to live by displaying hatred and anger all the time. Vikir continued to be shocked by what was going on. He knew that there was no way Hugo would talk badly about himself, and yet here he was, confessing everything. Vakir felt as though Hugo was testing him. Andromalius, his dark presence looming over the courtyard of the Baskerville clan, carefully tied Pomerian's hair while he inquired about her experience within the clan. Is it great to be among the Baskervilles? Andromalius' voice carried a hint of curiosity, though his intentions remained shrouded in malevolence. Pomerian, innocent and unaware of the sinister forces at play, nodded enthusiastically. Yes, it's wonderful. Everyone here is nice to me, and Grandpa Hugo always smiles when he sees me. Andromalius observed her with a calculating gaze, his mind churning with thoughts about how to exploit her presence for his own nefarious ends. Her status as Hugo's granddaughter made her a valuable pawn in his intricate game of demonology and manipulation. Unbeknownst to Pomerian, Andromalius harbored ambitions far darker than mere integration into the Baskerville family. His alliance with the Eighth Demon and their shared goal of weakening the Baskervilles underscored the gravity of his actions. Meanwhile, back in Hugo's chambers, Viker stood before the Patriarch, contemplating his next move. The offer of any reward he desired weighed heavily upon him, signaling a pivotal moment of decision between revenge and forgiveness. Vakir gazed at Hugo, whose demeanor had softened considerably since Pomerian's revelation. Memories of Hugo's past kindness and paternal concern resurfaced, clouding Vakir's resolve for vengeance. Hugo, Vakir began, his voice tinged with uncertainty. I appreciate your offer, but before I decide on my reward, there's something I must do. Hugo nodded solemnly, his eyes fixed upon Vakir with a mixture of anticipation and apprehension. I need to uncover the truth, Vakir continued, his tone firm. The truth about who framed me, who ordered my execution. I need answers before I can make a choice. Hugo's expression hardened slightly, understanding the gravity of Vakir's quest for justice. I understand, he murmured, his voice tinged with regret. I will help you in any way I can. With a nod of gratitude, Vakir turned to leave, his mind racing with thoughts of the path ahead. His journey toward reconciliation and understanding had only just begun, entwined with the dark mysteries of his past and the uncertain future of the Baskerville clan. Pomerian happily told him that Uncle Vakir was here along with Grandpa Hugo and Uncle Ostris, but then Andromalius asked her why she didn't mention his name 
and wanted to know if she knew his name, which made her think for a while. After a brief moment, Pomerian called him uncle. Set, a servant, appeared behind them, reminding Set that he hadn't started his isolated training. He turned to the servant, explaining that he wanted to see his niece before he started. The servant reminded him that the Patriarch had ordered no one to approach Pomerian, but Set ignored those orders, saying he knew about it, but wanted it to be a secret between him and Pomerian. She happily agreed to keep it a secret between them. As he continued to touch Pomerian's hair, Set couldn't help but comment on how nice it was, recalling how it reminded him of his sister Penelope. But this comment caught the attention of the servant, who questioned Set on how it was possible for him to have met Miss Penelope before, as she was sure he wasn't even born back then. Her questions caused Set to stir for a moment, realizing he had made a mistake. Set revealed his true form as Andromalius, causing the back of his head to reveal his demonic side while he told the nanny that his father was looking for her. The nanny could only stand in fear as her eyes began to tear up from facing the powerful demon. She let out a shriek and started to turn around as she heard it, but then noticed that the granny was gone. Andromalius was busy eating the nanny as Set explained to Pomerian that she had something urgent to do. He then asked Pomerian if she liked Grandpa Hugo, to which she happily said yes. Set also knew that Hugo liked Pomerian very much. With a sinister look on his face, Set recalled how Pomerian truly resembled Hugo's dead wife and daughter. His hands stretched out this time, forming a mouth with multiple sharp teeth in between. He reached out to their sweet little angel, wondering how much it would destroy Hugo if he were to kill Pomerian right here and now. But before he could take a bite out of Pomerian, a voice called out to Set. It was Ostris appearing at the right time. He questioned Set about the whereabouts of the nanny and why he was here. Pomerian looked up at Ostris with wide, innocent eyes, soaking in the solemn atmosphere that hung between them. She sensed something significant in Ostris's words, though she couldn't quite grasp the depth of his emotions. Thank you, Uncle Ostris, Pomerian said softly, her voice filled with genuine gratitude. Ostris smiled faintly, his hand still resting on her head. He pondered over the changes that Pomerian's return had brought to the Baskerville clan. For so long, Ostris had lived in the shadow of his father, Hugo, striving to emulate his cold and ruthless demeanor as the Vice Patriarch. But seeing Set's conflicted emotions and now expressing his own concerns openly, stirred something within Ostris. It was a revelation that perhaps there was more to leadership than the relentless pursuit of power and authority. As Pomerian stood before him, Ostris felt a strange mix of responsibility and tenderness. You've brought something special back to us, Pomerian, Ostris murmured, his voice barely above a whisper. Things are changing, and perhaps that's not entirely a bad thing. Pomerian tilted her head curiously, sensing the weight of Ostris's words even if she couldn't fully understand their implications. Meanwhile, Set, now alone in the corridors of the Baskerville estate, wrestled with his inner turmoil. The memory mix-up with Andromalius had unsettled him deeply, reminding him of the relentless pressure he faced as Hugo's son and Ostris's younger brother. I can't keep living like this, Set muttered to himself. His jaw clenched in frustration. He felt trapped between familial expectations and his own desires, simmering with resentment towards Ostris and the suffocating influence of their father. Yet beneath the facade of defiance, Set harbored a deep-seated yearning for acceptance and understanding. His interactions with Pomerian and the rare moments of vulnerability from Ostris had stirred dormant emotions within him hinting at a longing for connection that he couldn't easily reconcile with his upbringing. Back in Hugo's chambers, Vakir contemplated Hugo's offer of any reward he desired. The truth-seeking mission weighed heavily on his mind, intertwining with newfound complexities in his relationship with the Patriarch. The decision between revenge and forgiveness loomed large, echoing the delicate balance of power and emotion that governed the Baskerville clan. As Vakir prepared to embark on his quest for answers, he knew that whatever path he chose would irrevocably shape the future of those around him. Back at the cave hideout, Set stomped his foot on the ground rapidly. He bit his thumb once again, commenting out loud about how something was so annoying. After that day meeting with Pomerian and Ostris, Hugo hadn't left her side at all because he was smitten by his granddaughter. Set couldn't kill Pomerian. His demonic side started to appear in his eyes, frustrated over the fact that he had missed his chance because of Ostris's sudden appearance. With a quick snap of his neck, Andromalius regained his composure. He knew there was still plenty of time before the gate opened, so there was no need to rush. It might be more effective for him to kill Pomerian when she became even more valuable to Hugo. When that time came, Andromalius wondered how he was going to kill her. Should he poison her like he did with Hugo's wife Roxana and make it look like she died from an illness? Or should he use the barbarians like before with Penelope? His demonic side emerged as he smiled sinisterly, knowing that he was going to kill Pomerian 
in a more brutal way than those two. But as he was immersed in his thoughts, a familiar figure stood in front of the cave entrance. With his trusty sword summoned, Vikir had arrived. His bloodhound eyes filled with bloodlust, he took a massive swing with Beelzebub, destroying the barrier protecting the cave's entrance. This caught Set's attention as he felt it shatter. Set immediately stood up from his throne, grabbing his sword. He looked toward the cave entrance, realizing there was a crack in the trap. He couldn't believe that someone had actually come inside through the crack, making him wonder who it was exactly. From out of the darkness of the night, Vikir made his appearance. He showed up, reminding Set that as promised, he was here to visit him. Set was stunned to see Vikir there, wondering how it was possible. Vikir revealed himself with a calm confidence, despite Set's surprise at his stealth. Using his second slot skill, Silent Heal, granted by the ugly fish monster Set, Vikir acknowledged Set's oversight of his presence. Set, taken aback by Vikir's unexpected arrival and his ability to navigate through his traps, couldn't help but wonder if Vikir had also uncovered his true identity. As Vakir scanned the cave, his eyes fell upon the scattered skeletons, prompting him to speculate that his sudden appearance had disrupted Set's sinister operations. Why would you venture into such chaos, Set? Vakir questioned, hinting at Set's alleged involvement in the disappearances plaguing Underdog City. Set's expression shifted from dark contemplation to a chilling smile as he unveiled his demonic aura. He acknowledged that Vakir had pieced together the truth but was curious about how he had managed it. Matching Set's aura with his own bloodhound aura, Vikir returned a sinister smile of his own, implying that Set's days of hiding were over. Closing the distance between them, Set approached Vikir with sword in hand, confident in his ability to eliminate the lone intruder. Yet Vikir remained unfazed, calmly suggesting that there was no need for concealment since they were alone. Set, puzzled by Vikir's audacity, reason that eliminating him would resolve everything. With a swift swing infused with his demonic aura, Set struck Vikir, a grin spreading across his face at the apparent success of his attack. However, to his astonishment, Vikir stood unscathed, still capable of questioning Set's amusement. It was then that Set realized the unimaginable. His arm had been cleanly severed by Vikir's unseen blade, Beelzebub, the sword of gluttony. Andromalius, overwhelmed by agony and shock, knelt in pain, Grasping the severity of his situation, Vikir, demonstrating his prowess with Beelzebub, had delivered a blow that not only cleaved through flesh and bone, but also seemed to cut through Andromalius's very essence. As the truth dawned on Andromalius, he recognized the weapon that had inflicted such profound pain. He shouted at Vikir, asking him how he could have obtained the relic of the Grand King of Flies, the holy constellation of the ancient devil. Vikir expected such knowledge from demons as they truly knew a lot about themselves. But as he called out to Set, he revealed the true face of the man before him. Vakir knew that Andromalius was one of the ten demons who came to the human world to open the gate to the demon world, a member of the elite corpses. Hearing this, Andromalius could only shout in shock over how Vakir knew such information. But as he continued to stare at Vakir with his demonic eyes, he realized something else, the soul of Vakir. Andromalius could only wonder why this young soul smelled like the blood of their people making him think that Vakir had been to hell before. With his bloodhound eyes all lit up, Vakir could see that the being in front of him was the one who framed him in his previous life. As if leading him into thinking he was his savior wasn't enough, Set was also the one who executed Vakir in the end. Wake up, demon, said Vakir in a heavy tone, causing Andromalius to sweat profusely, as if Vakir had become a demon as well. Vakir told the demon with a big smile on his face, never to think that he was going to die comfortably before regression, and destruction fell upon the world. The citizens of a town were its first victims as they looked at the skies one peaceful day, unaware that death was upon them. The gate that connected the demon realm and human realm appeared in the skies above the innocent people. When the demons began to invade, humanity called it the Fall. The ones who opened the gate were the ten high-ranked demons who first came to Earth, known as the Ten Elite Corpses. During the long war against the demons, Vikir had the misfortune of meeting one of the ten elite corpses on the battlefield. His first reaction upon facing the demonic creature was fear and shock. The outcome of his battle against it was simply miserable. Surrounded by his fallen comrades, Vikir could only cling onto his sword as he watched one of the ten elite corpses flex on top of the cliff. Out of the 671 people who joined the battle, 666 died. Of the five survivors, four had lost their minds, so there was only one particular survivor, and the reason behind his survival was a simple one. The demon's fixation on the number 666, symbolizing their grim count of human lives, was a testament to their twisted pride. Andromalius, 
one of the ten elite corpses known for his overwhelming destructive power, stood before Vikir in the present, a stark contrast to the encounter a decade ago. Amidst the chilling scene of countless small skeletons drenched in blood, Vakir couldn't help but speculate on Andromalius's gruesome appetite for devouring young children. As Vikir's bloodhound aura surged with rage, focusing on the horrific sight before him, Andromalius's cruel laughter pierced the air. He mockingly revealed that the children weren't dead, but alive within his stomach, taunting Vikir with a grotesque display. Using his hand to shape the face of a deceased child, Andromalius manipulated its voice to plead for salvation, invoking Vikir's wrath even further. In response, Vikir, his eyes glowing with intensified fury, swung Beelzebub once more, severing Andromalius's remaining arm. The demon screamed in agony, collapsing before Vikir, who sternly silenced his attempts to deceive. Vikir knew well the impossibility of resurrecting the dead, despite Andromalius's unsettling displays. Andromalius, now desperate and in pain, revealed his regenerated arms calmly, acknowledging Vikir's exceptional status as a young mid-rank graduate at just 17. He recognized Vikir as an irregular anomaly, possessing the devil's holy constellation, Belzebub, hinting at unpredictable futures. Transforming his arm into a demonic blade, Andromalius declared his intent to eliminate Vikir then and there, driven by the necessity to eliminate potential threats. Vikir wasn't a pushover. He stared down the demon, flexing Beelzebub on his arm. Vikir told Andromalius that the only one dying tonight was him. Thus, the two sons of the Baskerville family, one from the Lida while the other from the Van's side, stood against each other in silence in the center of the cave, surrounded by the skeletons of multiple children. The moonlight illuminated their battlefield. Within seconds, the sons began their fight, cutting and slashing at each other endlessly, unleashing waves of the bloodhound aura everywhere. They seemed to be on equal footing, each able to repel and attract the other's sword attacks. After exchanging multiple blows in mere seconds, not a single strike had landed on either son. Andromalius smirked in the midst of their battle, thinking to himself that since Vakir's middle name was Vaughn, there was a significant difference between them. Being named Lyda, there was a family rule where collateral line and illegitimate children meant to be discarded and used as shields could only learn up to the fourth technique. Andromalius felt confident knowing this fact, believing it meant Vakir couldn't defeat him, as he knew up to the sixth technique. In the middle of their exchange, Andromalius managed to knock Vakir's arm away, much to Vakir's shock. In that split second, Andromalius wasted no time and unleashed Baskerville's sixth technique towards Vikir. However, Vakir remained calm. Facing the incoming sixth technique, he unleashed his own version, surprising Andromalius and leaving the demon with a stunned expression on his face. He couldn't believe that Vakir knew about the sixth technique, yet a smile crept onto his face as a sharp tentacle emerged from the side of his face, a surprise he had prepared in advance. Andromalius's tentacle surged towards Vikir with deadly precision, but Vikir anticipated the attack. His eyes locked onto the approaching danger, and in a swift response, he unleashed Beelzebub's power, enveloping the sword in his bloodhound aura. With a calculated strike, Vakir caught Andromalius off guard, executing the Baskerville's seventh technique. The demon was thrown back, wounds appearing across his body as blood spilled from his mouth in a cough. Recognizing the technique as the seventh fung, Andromalius was perplexed. This knowledge was traditionally reserved for the patriarch of the Baskerville family. However, Vakir wasted no time, his eyes gleaming with a deadly resolve. Launching another assault, Vakir's next attack struck true, Beelzebub plunging deep into Andromalius's chest. As Andromalius writhed in agony, Vakir seized the moment to lecture the demon. He mocked the arrogance of demons who considered themselves superior to humans, claiming it was easy to deceive such egotistical beings. Beelzebub dripped with the demon's blood as Vakir reminded Andromalius of past heroes who struggled to eradicate the ten elite corpses during the fall. But now, with the demons weakened and hiding, Vakir saw an opportunity to prevent their plans from unfolding. Whispering into Andromalius' ear with chilling calmness, Vakir revealed his knowledge of the demon's scheme to merge the human realm with the demon realm. He emphasized that by eliminating Andromalius and his cohorts, he could disrupt their grand design. Do you feel relieved? Vakir questioned with a murderous glint in his eyes, his aura suffusing the cave with a palpable threat. For the first time in his demonic existence, Andromalius experienced a profound sense of dread. A mere human had managed to instill fear in him. Feeling anger over this fact, the demon bit hard, raging out and cursing at Vikir for making it experience such a thing. Soon enough, 
A shell made of spikes and blood surrounded Andromalius, forcing Vikir to back off, even after backing off. Vikir's eyes were still fixed on the demon. He could see that Andromalius was inside something like a ball of thorns made of blood. A shield, said the demon, as the ball slowly started to disappear once it burst. Instead of human feet appearing, a pair of animal-like hooves was shown. The demon couldn't believe that Andromalius would show a mere human like Vikir his true form. Oh my word. Andromalius had completely shed Set's human form and revealed his real demonic side, emitting a deadly purple aura. Now guess this guy never skips leg day. Look at those thighs, man. The demon continued to show off his new form, even acknowledging that the extent of his power was unexpected. Summoning snakes like Medusa, Andromalius ended the chit-chat with a sudden attack, kind of reminding me of Orochimaru from Naruto. The snakes all locked onto their target, Vikir, who simply stood still as they closed in on him, using a zigzag-like pattern. Vikir relentlessly cut down the snakes that came close to him, but Andromalius was enjoying this moment, telling Vikir to keep trying and slicing them. Vikir did as he said, leaping and doing backflips to dodge the snakes while cutting and slicing them apart making his way toward Andromalius. But as he charged forward, Fakir was unaware of a single snake that managed to slip past his defenses. The snake landed a deep bite onto his shoulder before Fakir sliced off its head. Seeing this brought a smile to the demon's face as he announced that with a single bite, as long as there were living organisms around him who were injured, he would never die. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Harsh Day 10 Tier C42 who commented, I like your content that I can't wait for it's another part on our questism video. Thanks for commenting. Vikir calmly looked at his blood leaving his body, but then he started to smile before breaking into laughter, angering Andromalius, who shouted at Vikir about why he was laughing, wondering if he had lost his mind. Using his hand to hide his laughter, Vikir revealed that he found it funny to see a demon enjoying himself when he didn't even know what he was absorbing. It turned out to be true. Andromalius doubled over in agony, coughing blood as he knelt on the ground bewildered by the sudden affliction. Vikir, observing his reaction, casually asked the demon if he wanted to witness something remarkable. With Beelzebub, Vikir made a small cut on his wrist, letting his blood drip heavily onto the ground before Andromalius. The demon soon realized Vikir's blood was infused with potent poison, causing the earth to dissolve upon contact. But Vikir's demonstration didn't end there. He displayed his wrist, now fully regenerated after the self-inflicted wound, leaving Andromalius stunned. The demon struggled to comprehend how a mere human possessed such rapid regeneration and deadly poison, knowledge typically associated with formidable creatures like Madame Eight Legs of LaRue at Len Noir Mountain, the Nine-Headed Snake of the Titan's Land, and the Colossal Jellyfish of the Black Sea. As Andromalius screamed in pain before Vakir, the human continued to taunt him, probing if the demon desired more of his toxic blood, even tasting it himself to affirm its potency. Within Beelzebub, the spirit of Madame Eight Legs growled, seemingly displeased that Andromalius hadn't succumbed to her poison. This exchange solidified Vakir's belief that with the Baskerville Seventh Technique and Beelzebub's powers, he could indeed confront and defeat the ten elite corpses. Realizing his imminent demise after Vakir's devastating attacks, Andromalius grappled with disbelief. How had Vakir, once a mere monster, ascended to such formidable strength? Resolving to survive and warn the other corpses about Vikir's prowess, Andromalius began to gather the mana he had dispersed, dissolving the barrier that protected the cave from intruders. Vikir sensed the change and turned back to look at the entrance, believing that Andromalius had released the barrier. But as he looked back, the demon started to smile again. Let water turn into blood, it said. Soon enough, massive amounts of water started to pull together, forming a ball in the air behind Vikir. As the water formed a ball, it started to turn red like blood. Fakir looked at what was happening, realizing that Andromalius also had the ability to turn water into blood. Even though he didn't have all his power, Fakir figured that a high-ranking demon is still a high-ranking demon. Making a quick decision, Fakir cut his wrist once again and poured his blood into the pool of water, reminding Andromalius that it didn't matter what he did with the blood now, as he wouldn't be able to absorb it like before. But the demon had a different plan in mind. It revealed to Vakir that infusing his blood into the water so that he couldn't absorb it was useless, because he didn't turn the water into blood to absorb it. Instead of being absorbed, the blood water started to float in the air, forming balls all around Vakir. Arise, my blood knights, Andromalia said, leveling a reference. After saying those words, the blobs of blood water started to melt and drip onto the cave grounds. Emerging from it was a monster made of blood. Soon, 
The Kyr was surrounded by Blood Knights in every direction. With the appearance of the Blood Knights, Andromalius revealed to Vakir that they could use the Baskerville Sixth Technique, which he himself had learned. The demon was confident that even though Vakir could use the Seventh Technique, he couldn't go up against all the Blood Knights who could use the Sixth Technique. I guess this demon has never heard of plot armor, Vakir thought. With murder in his eyes, Andromalius went full demon mode, promising Vakir that he was going to kill him and then kill everyone he loves one by one. Leaving Vakir with these final words, Andromalius silently remained surrounded by all the Blood Knights, regretting going against the Ten Corpses. Realizing the danger posed by the Blood Knights and their ability to use the Sixth Technique, Vakir hastily searched through his pocket, unprepared for such a dire situation. In a flashback, he recalled walking with Hugo, discussing the reward that allowed him to choose anything he desired. From his pocket, Vakir retrieved a whistle, studying it intently before presenting it to Andromalius, who visibly recoiled at the sight. With a knowing smirk, Vakir questioned the demon about his familiarity with the whistle, a symbol deeply connected to the Baskerville clan. Andromalius, sweating nervously, understood Vakir's intent to blow the whistle. Without hesitation, Vakir took a deep breath and blew into the whistle with all his might, unleashing shockwaves that reverberated through the cave and beyond. Nearby, a powerful figure stood on a cliff, as if awaiting Vakir's signal. Gripping his sword tightly, the figure sprang into action the moment the whistle's sound echoed. Andromalius, thrown into full panic, commanded the Blood Knights to eliminate Vakir swiftly, but Vakir revealed the true power of the whistle. He could invoke the authority of the entire Baskerville clan. Moreover, the Black Whistle harbored another function, to harness the full force of the Baskerville clan. As Vakir activated this function, a crimson line appeared, cutting through the cave and extending outside the mountain, obliterating everything in its path. The sheer impact of this sudden assault sent the Blood Knights flying away from Vakir, powerless against the unleashed Baskerville might. Soon, more Baskerville clan members arrived, brandishing their swords and combining their techniques in a coordinated attack towards Andromalius's hideout. Andromalius watched in horror as his once secure cave hideout crumbled under the relentless assault. Half of the mountain vanished amidst the devastating barrage of Baskerville techniques. From the cliff, Hugo's voice resonated clearly, questioning why Vakir had called upon the entire Baskerville power, Vakir's sole purpose to hunt down a demon. Hugo appeared alongside Ostris and Boston who stood by his sides. Hugo was pleased with Fakir's actions as he expected this from his son. Fakir humbly bowed his head towards Hugo with his hand across his chest as a sign of respect. Andromalius was shocked to see this sight. He couldn't believe that the Patriarch of the Baskerville clan was here, and even the commanders and Vice Patriarch Ostris were present. Looking at the endless shadowy figures standing on the cliff side by side, the demon slowly realized that the entire Baskerville clan was here right now. With his hand stretched out to call the attention of the entire Baskerville clan, Hugo announced to everyone present that for the next six hours, he hereby declared Vikir von Baskerville, the possessor of the whistle, to have full command over their entire force. Upon hearing that order, Vikir slowly opened his eyes, revealing his bright red bloodhound eyes. He slowly gave out his command, calling forth everyone to rip Andromalius to shreds. The moment the command left his lips, a bloodhound had already appeared and stabbed Andromalius right in his chest, without giving him a chance to react to the sudden attack. Soon enough, like a pack of dogs, the entire bloodhound forces rushed towards Andromalius like an endless bloody wave, cutting, stabbing, and slicing the demon into pieces, as per the orders of Vikir von Baskerville. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps.